In this video, we're going to talk about basic stock valuation. We've talked about this uh, many different times in other classes and other, in other venues. But uh, in this case, we're going to look at three, four basic types of valuation for a corporation. So the first uh, technique that we want to look at is something referred to as the value of operations. And if you notice, the value of operations incorporates the free cash flows of the company. Additionally, we will also later look at the dividend valuation model. So we can look at from two points of view, value of operations or the value of the stock. Value of the stock uses dividends. Free cash flow uh, is what we use to find the value of operations themselves. The discount rates are different though. So the weighted average cost of capital, the cost of financing is the number that we use to find the value of operations and the required return of the stock from something like the capital asset pricing model uh, is the discount rate we would use for finding the value of the stock itself. And of course, we know all the particulars of what it means to own the stock, right? It represents ownership. It implies some form of control. You get to vote for some things. Um, Managers essentially act as agents. This is an important topic here. Talk, act as agents of the shareholders. So their ultimate goal then is to do what's best for the shareholder, which implies maximize stock. So let's think about this just for a second. Why do people buy stocks? They don't buy stocks so they have ownership. They buy stocks so that they can gain wealth. That is the purpose of investing. So the agents of the company, their goal should be there to help benefit and further the strategy of those folks that are offering funding to the company. There are different kinds of stocks, though, right? We can have stock that are referred to as being classified stock or tracking stocks. Classified stock, typically it's, it's an additional type of stock um, for lots of reasons. Maybe it's family owned stock. So the family owns one class of stock and then other investors own the other class of stock. There could be voting restrictions. There could be differences in dividends over time. So uh, a, a great example of this is General Motors that has several classes of stock uh, that you can invest in. Um, they all have maybe different prices and they all have uh, different voting rights and or different types of uh, dividends that are available. Now tracking stock is a little different. Tracking stock is the stock that a company issues that's issued on behalf of a division of that company. So, uh, you know, maybe um, Apple uh, has a division. They have a gaming division. They have their computer division. They have their phone division. Well, maybe they want to issue stock on the um, gaming division. So that stock will be issued. Those funds can be used within that company for expansion, development, et cetera. But the stock of that division follows that division's um, financial standing. The entire company obviously is has all the ball of wax underneath of it, if you will. But the tracking stock usually doesn't have voting rights. because it's not part of, or it, it doesn't represent the whole uh, overlying stock, if you will, or overlying company. So again, you can buy pieces, these underlying pieces, 
And maybe they do it because um, that company is, that division maybe is not performing quite as well as the rest. So they pull that company out and separate and segment it so that it stands on its own, sort of. And then the rest of the company uh, that maybe everybody sees as being a better, the better parts, uh, it has the ability to flourish a little bit more and increase in value. So there are different approaches. We're going to look at basically three different approaches. The free cash flow model and the dividend growth model. These models actually are very similar in formula. So we've already seen that in the very first slide of this video. So they're very close to the same concept, if you will. We just start with different cash flows, and we start with different required returns. In the end, we also have what are referred to as comparables or multipliers, and we'll discuss those as we as we get to the to the uh, next couple of videos. So the free cash flow. What is that? This is the cash flow that's available for distribution to all of the company's investors. Now, I, this is kind of technical, but I think it's kind of important to know who are the investors? Who are these people? There's actually two sets of investors. There are investors who own equity, right? Those are our shareholders. But there are also our creditors. If you think of the definition of an investor, it's a person who provides funding so that a company can go out and buy things, but they only give the company money if they expect something in return. Certainly, that implies creditors and shareholders. The weighted average cost of capital, uh, we'll discuss in some later videos, is the overall rate of return required by all of the company's investors. So this is just the cost of financing. And since we use a variety of financing tools, it is a weighted average cost of financing. And again, we will discuss this in a lot more detail in some later videos. So the value of operations is the present value of all the uh, future free cash flows discounted at the cost of financing, weighted average cost of capital. So who has claims to the value of the company? We have debt holders have the first claim, followed by preferred stockholders, and then in the very end, any remaining value belongs to stockholders. And if you remember some from some previous videos, sometimes we refer to uh, stockholders as being residual owners. They only get something if there's something left over. So what does this look like graphically? Well, the value of the operations includes everything outside of the marketable securities of the company. And that uh, value of operations, this outer piece here, can be presented as divided by the equity, debt, and preferred stock of the, the company. Now, again, in later uh, videos, when we try to pool all this stuff together, the, this is all by choice, right? Managers decide this relative shape of the pie. More conservative investors will have less debt, maybe no preferred stock, but more aggressive would expand debt and preferred because they want to take a riskier position. So as we look at this, again, we just have the value of operations, right? The value of that uh, circle that, with the exception of marketable securities, 
That includes, that's the value of operating the company itself. So uh, the idea though is how do you find, if you look at this formula, how do you find something to infinity? Well, if we make a couple of assumptions, um, mathematically this can be solved. Uh, it's really an, uh, an algebraic or a, I guess calculus is a form of algebra. It's, a, it's an algebraic solution to figure this out. So the assumption that we're going to make is that we have constant growth of the free cash flow over time. So if free cash flows are expected to grow at a constant growth rate, then this formula is algebraically equivalent to the previous formula. So to find the value of the operations today times zero, we need to know the cash flow today and then you multiply that by one plus the predicted or expected growth rate to infinity of that cash flow. You divide that by the weighted average cost of capital minus the growth uh, of the cash flow to, again, to infinity. Now, the only thing that uh, limits this particular formula is that the growth rate has to be less than the cost of financing. So again, it's still the free cash flow, right? But in this case, we're starting with what we know. We know the free cash flow today. We know what the cost of financing is today. What we have to do as investors and as managers, we need to figure out or predict what we think the growth rate will be over the long term, in this case of free cash flow. So here we have an example. We have twenty-four million dollars in uh, free cash flows. Weighted average cost capital eleven percent. Growth rate of free cash flows is five percent. We have some short-term investments of a hundred million dollars. I mean. Really, we could just call this cash for all intents and purposes. That'll work out. Debt's 200 million, preferred stocks 50 million, and we have uh, 10 million in uh, shares. So how can we do this? We have a workbook uh, that's the stock valuation free cash flow worksheet. Um, so again, if you plug the numbers into the formula, we end up with $420 is the, this is probably uh, billions, right? But 420 is the value of operations. Now from the value of operations, we need to incorporate uh, some of the numbers. I see I have a typo here, I'm gonna have to fix that. So take the cash available, we know that's 100. Debts, 200, preferred stocks, 50. So again, if we do the calculation, take 420, add to it the short-term uh, investments, that means the whole company is worth $520. Subtract 200, subtract 50, we end up with 270 is the value of equity. And again, we have this formula. The value of operations is the value of equity plus the value of debt plus the value of preferred, plus the short-term investments of the company. So again, just solving algebraically for value of equity, in this case, divided by the 10 million, right? That gives us roughly a $27 per share value of operations. So what happens with these projections though? What happens if the projections are not constant? I mean, and in reality, they're never going to be constant. But from time to time, maybe the companies will come up with a, a, a new product or a, a, a new process that dramatically changes um, the financial cash flows for a short period of time. Now, what happens in business, I'm sure we're all aware of this, what happens in business is that somebody is going to uh, do a little corporate espionage and they're going to figure out what you, what you do 
and they're going to replicate it. Of course, when they do that, that increases the supply of products available, which is going to bring down the value of, of, of the product. It's going to drive down the price. price uh, cost of goods are going to go up. So we're going to have a squeeze on profits, which then means free cash flows over the long haul eventually will get off to some what you, what you might call a an average, right? So I think of this as being something called uh, occasionally, we'll do this also with the, uh, sometimes it's referred to as super normal growth. For some reason, there's a spurt in growth. And then from there on out, it turns back to the average growth rate. So there's no change in anything other than this is a, um, a an adjustment, if you will, to the free cash flow exchange. So again, free cash flows are going to be forecast for this short period of time. And then the growth that's not constant during the forecast. So we can't use that model for that, but we will be able to use that free cash flow model for the time after this super growth rate. So here we find our, uh, our, our um, information here, right? So we know here's the free cash flows that we had in our example, negative 10, 20, and 35. Now we also have what? We have cash flows that will follow that out to T, whatever that time frame might be. And we can do this. Again, this is in this stock valuation free cash flow worksheet. You can input the year's cash flows, right? We also have some information about the cost of capital, 10, 11%. We also know what the uh, projected growth rate was. So I believe it was uh, 5%. So again, those things we incorporated. So in year four, we're, we predict free cash flows or the value to be 613 but we need to bring that back to time zero. So this column here calculates the present value of the forward years. So the present value of negative 10, 20, and 35 is 32, and the present value of 613 today, 447. So this gives us a value of this company of 480.67. Well, that's nice, but what does that really tell us? I mean, it obviously gives us the value of operations in this specific instance with um, uneven or non-constant growth. But how important is that number? So one of the things we can do with this number is let's find the percentage of value that's due to long term. So over the long term, where is all the value coming from? So if you take the present value of this future price value way out here, that represents what we think it's worth from uh, end of year three onward through uh, infinity. So divide that by the total value tells us that 93% of the value of this company is going to come from the far future. Not the current ideas, but the far future. And again, we would want this number to be bigger rather than smaller. And they tell us here that on average, uh, for the average company, this should be around 80%. So this company is exhibiting some long-term growth that the average company, quite frankly, is not um, predicting or assuming is going to happen. So I look forward to seeing you in the next video.